Hello everybody and welcome to today's video. After the last couple of weeks have turned out to be quite wild and busy for me, I've had the chance to finally put East 9 Monstrum Nox through its paces. It has been on the back burner a little bit for me, I've been playing it in little bits and pieces, but I did miss review embargo lifting, you would have seen some other people have got their reviews out. And you might have been wondering where mine is. I am making up for that now. I have got a review going up on digitallydownloaded.net soon where you can check out my full critical thoughts. But I wanted to do this video to talk more broadly about how this is the first East game that I have really enjoyed without some really big qualifiers on the entertainment value that I've got out of it. See, normally East is not my thing. What the series has traditionally done really well, which is namely fast, pacey, very active and very dynamic combat, hasn't really been what I look for personally in JRPGs. I do like a game with a good combat system, of course, but I prefer that combat to be in the context of a narrative-driven thing, and East doesn't usually care much about that context. Narratives in this series tend to be pretty thin and shallow, and as far as characters go, I mean, the big one, the main guy, Adol, he just doesn't do that much for me. He's just not that interesting of a character to carry an entire series and make it one of my favorites. Whereas, you know, some other JRPG series have had much stronger narratives and much more character-driven experiences, which is what I look for personally in the genre. And that is until now. East 9 has a lot going for it for a person like me. It retains the super fast dynamic combat system, but it also goes to much greater lengths to really build a sense of character, setting and lore. And with that comes a much darker bent to the game, which was always going to happen I guess. Too many game writers confuse depth and meaningful narratives to be dark narratives, but putting that aside it is still well written and has some real moments going for it. Heck, for the first time, as far as I can remember, East 9 is an East game with side quests and stories that are genuinely worth doing. We're not talking about something of the quality of, say, Yakuza with regards to the side stories, but the world is filled with interesting characters and problems to solve, and it really helps to build the city hub that the game takes place in as something that is vibrant and just full and packed with adventure. Indeed, the city itself is fascinating as a setting. It is a prison city, and you'll often find yourself either breaking in or out of that facility, but the game perfectly recreates what a Dao place such an entire city would be. So if you build an entire city around a prison as its main industry as such, the kind of experience of that city is a bit different to cities that are built around more light-hearted things like tourism, and this game really captures that aesthetic and vibe perfectly. And it is as a result of that, it becomes the perfect setting for a series of stories about freedom fighters and Robin Hood likes too. And that is, of course, what you do spend a lot of your time following along with their stories. So early on, on excuse me, early on in the game, Adol is unwillingly recruited into a group called the Monstrums. And as the story progresses on, he makes friends with the other Monstrum warriors and helps them out with their own personal and professional problems. The first Monstrum that you experience, and I'm not going to give too much of the narrative away, but she is stealing cash from a wealthy company to feed people that are living in a slum area and suffering from the decay of their water quality. It's a very relevant theme to the real world, and it's told with surprising honesty at times. And it's also really nicely structured in terms of the way it flows, and where the revelations come in and the payoff at the end of course is that you get a new character to join your party which is a good thing and she becomes a close friend and confidant to your character through the rest of the adventure it's a far cry from the east series tradition of really just kind of pointing you at the next dungeon and letting you off the leash and when you run into characters they're all introduced in a very simple way and it's just more about what the narrative can do to push you into the next combat section. This game really has the sense that it's willing to take its time and give you more than just dungeons and combat to look forward to. Also, while the game certainly has its dark moments as befitting the theme, the aesthetics and everything else about it, one of the first story, side stories that you complete, for example, is to rescue two kids that got accidentally drawn into a dark world when their ghost of a father wanted to see them one more time. So we're talking pretty dark material here, and that trend kind of continues through the entire game. 
Despite those moments, Ease 9 does have plenty of levity as well. It has some really eclectic and eccentric characters, and it has some moments of some very dry humour. Adol himself remains a fairly silent protagonist, as fits with the series as a whole. You do get to choose what his uh, responses are to some dialogue moments, but he is still very much a very silent protagonist. But the group that he forms around him, they bounce off one another really nicely, and that helps to provide an impetus to move on with the game and the plot. So another thing that I think Monstrum Knox absolutely nails, and I've mentioned this before in the video, is the atmosphere. I do think that this element will be controversial a little bit with fans, because Yeast is probably best associated with grand adventures into the wild and ruins of antiquity, whereas, by contrast, most of Ease 9 takes place in a gothic city with a gothic-style nightmare world that you go into uh, on occasion. However, to me, this ended up being pretty engaging stuff, and for a couple of reasons. Firstly, you really do get to explore all the little nooks and crannies within the world of East Nine and its city, thanks to an expansive range of abilities to climb, dash, soar and slide across the rooftops and below bridges, and you really get to go vertical and horizontal throughout this city. The Gothic art movement is heavily associated with architecture, of course, pretty much everybody knows that, I think. Uh, and as you run around the world looking for hidden chests and the like, you do get to enjoy the gothic architecture of this world in full. Especially since in many cases combat is actually optional while you're wandering around the city. It is there if you want to grind up some experience levels or just do some fighting. But you can spend a lot of time just not fighting and going through this world and just experiencing all the architecture and stuff. And while it is a visually simple game, the art direction really does nail the elements that I think are important to gothic architecture. So actually exploring the city was very atmospheric as a result. And I do think the atmosphere also suits the combat system, especially when you travel into the nightmare world and get swamped by a massive range of enemies that are there. Every time you go into that space, it is very hostile, and you do do a lot of fighting. It's non-stop action while you're in that space. And East Nine's combat system is so fast and fluid that it has this really elegant quality to it, that pairs nicely with the elegance of the gothic art movement itself. So it comes across as this carefully considered experience on the part of the developer. This isn't just an example of them taking the East characters in action and deciding to go dark and mature on a whim with it. It's a genuine attempt to build something that is distinctive and interesting to the series without compromising the core soul, I guess of what the existing fans of the series enjoy. Whether it re resonates with them or not is another matter entirely, and I guess we'll find out over the coming months and years whether it is remembered as a good East game, but they certainly have tried to balance out their desire to do something a little bit different and creative with the series with their desire to give existing fans a game that is identifiably East. The one downside, and of course I do have to mention this, is that in playing the game on the PlayStation 5, I found that East 9 crashes a lot, and I have seen other people mention this as well, so I know it's not just my PlayStation 5. It crashes a lot. I'd say once per hour at least, on average, and that is a lot for a JRPG when you're going to be sitting down to play it for 3, 4, 5 hours at a time. You're looking at a couple of crashes every play session. I didn't test it on PlayStation 4 to check if it was more stable on that console and I do assume that there will be patches coming that will address the issues on the PlayStation 5 as well. I haven't let that factor into my review or my review score because I do think that this is one of those instances where the bugs will be ironed out via patches and while it would have been ideal for the game to be released bug free of course it will be fixed. I'm 99% sure it's going to be fixed so I didn't let that factor into my score but I am mentioning it for people who maybe pick the game up right now and are wondering why it's crashing a lot, you're not alone. It's not a huge deal in terms of your ability to progress through the game because the autosave is quite generous and you can save manually at any point as well and I did that so I never lost more than a couple of seconds of play at a time but it does break with the immersion and atmosphere every time that it crashes and then you have to load the game up again and given how important atmosphere and immersion are to the game it was a letdown and I'm not going to deny that. But, anyway, like I said, I'm sure it's going to be fixed, and I'm not concerned about it. That aside, I love this game as my favourite East game to date, and of course, 
in saying that, I'm now going to have a bunch of East Hardcore fans yelling at me. I know that Nihon Falcom tends to attract the really hardcore fans. Please don't hate me for liking a game that maybe you don't, or whatever, or not liking previous East games that you loved. But anyway, it is what it is, and I like what I like. I hope everybody does enjoy that. this that plays it, though. Of course, I would hate for anybody not to enjoy a game that they're looking forward to. I do think that this is a seriously well-made action JRPG from one of the veterans in the genre, and it is good to see that the creative energy that has powered the series hasn't dissipated. They're still finding new ways of doing interesting things with the series and their main character. Uh, do let me know your own thoughts in the comments about how you think this one sits against the rest of the series. I'm actually very interested in hearing what the series faith faithful think about it. Otherwise, just to go through the usual process that I do at the end of my videos, please do click that like and subscribe button. That way you won't miss any of my other videos and please consider throwing me a dollar or two on Patreon each month if you can because with that support I can continue to do grow this channel doing more and more interesting things and I've got lots of other ideas so I need your support and your support is most welcome and appreciated. Also, if you do like visual novels and want to support us in another way without backing me on Patreon, feel free to buy one of my visual novels. You do get some good fun games to play, at least I like to think so, and you will be supporting the site and all my work on it, and I would call that a win-win, I think. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thanks as always for tuning in. Check out my review on East 9 at digitallydownloaded.net. should be up within a couple of hours of this video going up, depending on my timing. And otherwise, we'll catch you next time.